There we go. Thank you. In the, the book of Romans, we've been looking at some, some teachings by Paul, uh, and he's, he's laid out before us the things that we need to believe as Christians. And then once he's got done with that, he gets into the practical application of those things, and we've been calling it of how to behave. So as a Christian, you know, we, we look at these, this idea of how to behave, and it brings up some questions to me. Can we or can't we? Should we or shouldn't we? Would we or wouldn't we? You know, uh, for a lot of years growing up in, in, in the church, it was all about the thou canst and thou canst nots. You know, it, it was about the things that you should do or shouldn't do, you could do, you couldn't do, and that's been a big battle in the churches for a lot of years. You know, the, the, in fact, there's been, uh, you know, churches that have separated because of these very things. You know, some things get right down to being as silly as the color of hymnals. You know, some churches have separated because some people think that the hymnals should be red because that signifies the blood of Christ, or they should be white because that signifies the purity of Christ. And, you know, and a lot of things, it just, it gets downright to be ridiculous of, of the things that, you know, churches will fight about. But it's, it, it goes on all the time. And really, that's kind of a little bit of what Paul is addressing. You know, from chapter 12 on in the book of Romans, you know, he's addressing these issues. And, and in verse 2 of chapter 12, there's, there's quite a, 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 an appeal to us or a, a reaching out to us. It says in verse 2, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So let me ask you, have you ever been transformed in your mind, the renewing of your mind? You know, that, that, that happens, I think, as you spend more and more time with God and with, with the word. You get inside the word and, and you find out that it, it gets inside of you and it cleans you and it, and it points out some things like we've talked about that maybe you weren't ready for God to point out, but yet, it, you know, when God points them out, it's time to deal with those things. And he transforms us, you know, uh, and then and only then will we be able to really test what God's will is. You know, not the things that the church says you can or can't do or the things that we should or shouldn't do, but what God says that was acceptable and what pleases him. Notice that. It says his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Do you agree that God's will is, is pleasing? Is it perfect? Is it good? You know, I, I think if you really drill into it, you find out what God wants for us is good for us. You know, you, you read the Bible, and, and again, like I said, you know, growing up, it was all about the, what you, you know, thou shalt not is what I remember a lot of. You know, you can't do this and you can't do that. And, you know, and some of the things were kind of trivial, you know, I would say. You know, for some people, they said, well, you can't even play cards. You, you mean Uno is a tool of the devil? You know, or something like that. You know, that's what they equate it to. But for some people, dealing with certain, you know, issues in their lives, that could very well be something that they struggle with. And Paul's going to deal with those things of, of what we do as believers. Do we look down upon them or do we, we love on them? And we know the answer is, is that we're supposed to love on them and help them through these times. So we find ourselves, we've, we've worked our way down through uh, to chapter 14. So if you've if you got your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 14. And he's going to deal with some issues here that the, the church in Rome, you know, it's a, it's a new church. They, they've, you know, they haven't been around that long, but yet they're already dealing with a lot of issues that I think are common to God's people. You know, these, a lot of these people have come out of Judaism, 
Some of them have come you know, to Christ from being a Gentile. So there, there's a vast diversity in this church. And they're dealing with a lot of these issues. And Paul's writing about these issues now. So we're going to start out at verse 1. And it says, Accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. One man's faith allows him to eat anything. But another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not. And the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does. For God has accepted him. Looking back there in verse 1 in the NIV here, it says, you know, that we are without passing judgment on disputable matters. Are there disputable matters in the church? Like I said, hymn, hymn, hymnal colors? Is that a disputable matter? Yeah, who cares what color they are? They're hymns. How about the color of the carpet? I've seen churches, literally, I know churches that have split because of the colors of carpet. Those are disputable matters. Those are, those are opinions, aren't they? Well, here he, he gets into other disputable matters. Food. You know, like I said, some of these people have come out of Judaism. Do you think they struggled with food? What, what they could eat and what they couldn't eat? I mean, even the, the Apostle Peter, as we find out in, in Acts chapter 10, you know, this was Peter as he was getting ready to go to Cornelius' house. And, and, and the Lord revealed something to him. You know, he was hungry and he says he was waiting for his, the food to be prepared and he fell into a trance. And God gave him a vision of a, of a sheep being lent down from heaven from its four corners. And inside the sheep was all manner of four-legged four, uh, four hoofed creatures and, and, and lizards and, and, and you know, fowl of the air. And, and God said to him in that passage, rise up, kill and eat. And what was Peter's response? Not so, Lord. I've never put anything in clean to my mouth. Well, when God tells you to rise up and do something and you say, not so, Lord, that's usually a, a you know, bad mix. But what God was revealing to Peter that day is he was declaring all food clean. He was also declaring to Peter, and Peter was realizing this later as he went to Cornelius' house, when, when the word of God was spoke to them that the power of the Holy Spirit came upon the Gentiles there at Cornelius' house. And God had declared that even the Gentiles could be saved. That, that salvation was open not only to the Jew, but to the Gentile too. So for those who are coming out of Judaism, yeah, they, they're struggling. You know, for you and I, we don't think anything about picking up a piece of bacon and chewing on it. But for somebody that's coming out of, of Judaism, you know, pork was an unclean animal. And they might still struggle with that. And that's what, what Paul is saying here. He's saying one man's faith allows him to eat anything. But another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. See, in the Roman market there, the, a lot of the meat that was there had been sacrificed to pagan gods. So it may not only be pork, but it may be something that had been dedicated to some Roman god. And, and, and for them, they struggled with that. As we're going to find out, Paul, he's saying basically he, it, it didn't, didn't matter to him anymore because he knew the truth, that God had declared all faith clean, especially if we give thanks for it. You know? So it says, The man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not, and the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does. Why? Because God has set us free. It's interesting. Have you ever known anybody that tried to crawl back underneath the law? I've known a lot of people. They, 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 they think, well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll observe this portion of the law because that will impress God. Well, well if you're going to observe some part of the law, you really have to observe all of the law. And it goes on from there. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. And he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. 
Paul's saying here basically, you know, that we shouldn't be trying to judge everybody else. We should be worried about ourselves. What does your faith tell you? You know, that, that, that's what he's implying here is basically we have to answer to God in our beliefs and in our walk. See, for a lot of years, you know, people have, have, have based their walk with God based upon what the church says or upon what somebody else says, some man or some teaching. Here it says you're going to answer to God. And, and, and basically, to his own master, he stands or falls. What he's saying to me is, is, it's more important to listen to what God says and not what man says. And it says here, though, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. You know, as we journey through the, you know, the, the epistle to the Romans here, you know, and, and we're, if we're sincere about our desire to please God, we're going to be seeking him and, and having him teach us his ways. And, and we're going to be transformed. And it goes back to what is said there in, in verse 2 of chapter 12. We're going to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. We get to put away all that bad teachings maybe that we came up under. I hope that you didn't come up under bad teaching. I hope you came up under biblical teachings. But that's a struggle a lot of people have is they've come out of bad theologies. And that's baggage they bring with them. And, 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 and the idea here is, is we don't condemn them for those things. We don't look down upon them. Why? Because they've been saved by grace just like us. They've been given a gift just like we've been given. And we didn't deserve that gift. God has given us his son as a gift. You know, so. And it's God who makes us stand. It says one man, in verse 5, considers one day more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. I grew up for years thinking Sunday was the Sabbath. Then I found out, well, no, it's really Saturday. Kind of messed with my mind. And then, then it was funny, uh, up at the Cowboy Church, we had one gentleman that came there fairly regularly because he said, I like coming here because you meet on the right day of the week. He was a Seventh-day Adventist. I didn't have the heart to tell him it was after sundown on Saturday, so technically in the Jewish terms it was Sunday. But the Sabbath, the sabbatical law, you know, have you ever ran into those people that try and keep the sabbatical law? Well, again, if you're going to keep one portion of it, you need to keep all of it. And the sabbatical law in Exodus 35.3, we're told, do not light a fire in your dwellings on the Sabbath. How many of you turn on a light switch on the Saturday? Isn't that the same thing? I mean, every aspect of, of keeping the law, you, you need to observe if you're going to try and keep these things. But notice again what Paul said there. He says, one man considers one day more sacred than another, and another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. If somebody says, that I'm going to be a Sabbath keeper, are you convinced in your mind that that's what you need to do? Then, then do it to God. For, for, for me, you know, I have you know, the blessing of having God dwell inside of me. So every day can be a Sabbath day. I can spend time with God each and every day. And here he says, you know, every day uh, alike. How, you know, what do you consider? You know, what days can you go and worship God? All, all of them. I think all the days that end in Y are the days that I'll, I'll, I can worship God. So, it's up to you. See, see, that's the problem. We try and make it a, a formula. You have to do this. You have to eat this, or you have to, to worship on these days. You know, we, we try and make it, well, this is what you have to look like when you go to church. You ever grew up in that kind of a situation? You know, suit and tie? 
The women had to wear, you know, dresses, and, and the kids all had to be, you know, dressed alike. You know how hard it is to get a five-year-old in a suit and a tie and have them enjoy it? I still don't enjoy it. But, but that's kind of what we know we grew up with. And there's a lot of people, that's how they believe today. You've got to look the part, right? It, it's funny how Jesus got after the Pharisees. He called them whitewashed tombs because it was all about the outside appearance, wasn't it? How they looked, how they walked, how they talked. And he says, you're full of dead man's bones. See, he looks on the inside. You know, I, 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 I think about it. And I, I'm thankful that we have the, the account of the, of the thief on the cross. Because I think there's been a lot of people throughout the ages being given great comfort through his ministry. Do you realize he had a very powerful ministry? You know, you might say, you know, he's got just a few verses in, in the Gospels and he died because he was a thief. But yet, he, he wasn't baptized, yet Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Was he in a three-priest suit when he came to the Lord? No, he was pretty much naked, hanging there on the cross. And Jesus blessed him with that, that, that statement. when he, You know, the thief says, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. And Jesus says, today, you'll be with me in paradise. You know, what our ideas of how we come to Christ and how we can worship him, I think, are a little bit different than God's ideas. His idea is that we come in spirit and in truth and not worrying about the outsides. It continues on there in Romans. It says in verse 6, he who regards one day as special does so to the Lord. He who eats meat eats to the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. How many of you say thanks for your food when you, when you sit down and eat? You know, God says that's something that we need to do. It says, verse uh, 7, For none of us lives to himself alone, and none of us dies to himself alone. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. See, I think that's something that is easy to lose sight of. We're not our own. We are bought with a price. You know, the, the slaves, when they, they could be redeemed from the slave market for a price. They could be bought out of the slave market to never have to return once again. That's that idea that, that, that our sin debt has been paid in full. We've been redeemed. We've been bought. And we're no longer our own. We belong to him. We can find that also in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 through 15 says, For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So when we're talking about how to behave, who is it that we're living for? Are we living for ourselves? Or are we living for him who redeemed us from the ways of sin and death? For none of us lives to himself alone and none of us dies to himself alone. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Verse 9 says, For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life, so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. You then, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, 
and every tongue will confess to God. So then, each of us will give an account of himself to God. Everything we say as Christians, as believers, everything we do, we're going to appear before Christ. Now, there's some going to appear before Christ at the judgment seat of Christ. And that's a, a judgment seat of condemnation for their rejecting of, uh, of Christ. They're going to die for their own sins. But you and I, we're going to appear before Christ at what we refer to as the Bema seat, the, the reward seat of Christ. But yet, it says here, we're still going to have to give an account. Did we love or did we condemn people? Did we look down upon them because maybe they, they worship on Tuesdays instead of on Sundays? Or, or, or they, they eat pork instead of not refraining from eating pork? Or, you know, all those things that man has, has made an important part of, of religion. We're going to have to answer for, to God of, of why we've done that. You know, we just looked at it. We're not to look down upon God's, you know, his people. But yet that goes on all the time in the world that we live in. You know, the haves and the have-nots and the coulds and the could-nots and the shoulds and the shouldn'ts and all them people, they look down upon each other. I mean, the denominations, you know, you know the, this denomination will, will scoff at that denomination and that one will look down upon this one and, and, and it's God's people tearing apart God's people. Instead of agreeing with what it says there in verse 1, accept those whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. As long as we can agree that Christ is the, is the reason, that salvation is found in him and him alone, it's faith in believing in Jesus Christ and what he's done for us on the cross, the rest of this, I think we could rack up to disputable matters. You know, for some people, I mean, yeah, they'll go to, to blows over some issues. Instead of just saying, you know what, let's pray about it. Let's see what God says. And, you know, sometimes we can agree to disagree. Because, you know what, you, if a person's been raised all their life believing some, certain things, you're not going to change them with an argument. We can love on them, though. And to say, you know, whatever your faith, whatever your conviction is because of what you've read in the Bible, you need to, to stand with that. But this is what I believe because this is what I've read in the Bible and, and I have to stand on that. So then, each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. As one who is in the, who is in the Lord Jesus, I am com fully convinced that no food is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for him it is unclean. If your brother is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy your brother for whom Christ died. Do not allow what you consider good to be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. We just spent a whole bunch of time looking at Romans chapters 1 through 11, and, and, it, and it talks about righteousness. Where is our righteousness found? In Christ Jesus. So that should be our focus, is being in Christ Jesus, being Christ-like. And, and, and peace. You know, Jesus said, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. The church you know, and we're, we're not talking about matters of, you know, that, that would, would contradict the word of God and contradict what God says about salvation. We're talking about matters of, you know what, maybe there's some things that, you know, somebody wants to do a program, you know, uh, some kind of a study and somebody else doesn't. 
you know what, you know, we can we can decide that, hey, we need to think about the peace that, you know, if you guys want to do that, as long as it's based on the Bible, we're good with that. But peace, the peace of God, and joy. You know, why did Jesus endure the cross? For the joy set before him. The idea that he gets to spend eternity with us in heaven. If that was his focus and his aim, if we are truly calling ourselves Christian, that should be our aim too, to spend eternity with our brothers and sisters in peace and joy in heaven too, along with Christ. He paid the price for us. But to be in right standing with God again, you know, these are the things that God has laid out for us, but yet, you know, we love to pick a fight sometimes, don't we? You know, which version do you read? Well, what does your faith tell you? Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. We need to build up the body, not tear it down. You know, we see so many people that have gone through cancers and we, we see the effect that it has on their bodies. You know, it's sad to see when the, the body called the church gets a cancer inside of it and what it can do to the body. How it destroys and tears apart that what God has told us to build up and to edify. Do we please God when we become that cancer? When, when the, the, the church itself is in, in the process of, of tearing itself down. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a man to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. I think that applies in, in many aspects of our lives. You know, we've been set free from the power of sin and death, but yet... You know, like I said at the beginning, maybe somebody struggles with gambling. And for them, a deck of cards is, is a temptation that's more than they can bear. We don't sit there and say, oh, I'm just playing solitaire. It's no big deal. We're not edifying the body then. We're tearing that person down. Just like food. You know, maybe, maybe you have a, uh, somebody that's just come out of Judaism. And for them, they've struggled all their lives with clean and unclean things. And for you to go up and say, hey, want a ham sandwich? You know, is, is that building them up or is that causing them to, to stumble? I don't know. But we should be perceptive in knowing that maybe they've struggled with that. So we don't use our freedoms to, to cause them to stumble. Verse 21 says, it's better not to eat meat or drink wine or to do anything else that will cause your brother to fall. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the man who does not condemn himself by what he approves. But the man who has doubts is condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith. And everything that does not come from faith is sin. everything that does not come from faith is sin. You and I should be seeking God all the time about our daily lives. I've heard some people take it to an extreme. You know, Lord, do I turn left or do I turn right? I'm going to wait here to hear from you. And for them, maybe that's what they have to do. I don't look down upon them. We shouldn't either. Everything that we do should be by faith. It kind of goes back to that story of, uh, of how, you know, we love to point out the speck in somebody else's eye, yet we have the plank hanging out of our own eyes. Do we have things that we need to, to work on in our own lives? I do. Those things that we struggle with? You well, know, we should be walking by faith and not by sight. 
And that's the hard thing to do sometimes, is to, to, to listen to God on everything, in every aspect of our lives. Because maybe you were like me, I grew up in the church and there was a lot of things that was taught that isn't necessarily in God's word. You know, there, there was you know, arguments that arose of you know, how to conduct a worship service. I don't see the order of worship listed here. I just know that we're supposed to come to him in spirit and in truth and worship him. You know, how about every other aspect of our lives? It should come from faith. I'm going to, one more passage is found in 1 Peter chapter 4. And it says there in verse 1 of 1 Peter chapter 4. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because he who has suffered in his body has done, is done with sin. As a result, he does not live the rest of his earthly life for the evil human desires, but rather... For the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They think it strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood, a dissipation, and they heap abuse on you. I don't know about you, but that seems to be more and more prevalent each and every day I see, you know, outside in the, in the, in the world. Is the world is just amazed that you don't join with them in what they consider good, and what they consider fun, and what they consider right. And when we stand for the truth, they heap abuse on us. It's, you know, we take criticism because we won't join with them. You know, and how are we living our lives? As it said there in verse 2, are we living it rather for the will of God? What's God's will for us? Isn't that really what we're, you know, what, how does he want us to behave? It goes right back to what we learned a couple weeks ago. It's about love, isn't it? The first and greatest command was to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our might. And the second command was like unto the first, to love our neighbor as ourselves. That's how God wants us to conduct ourselves, with love. Because, you know, I've heard for so many years people saying, oh, I don't go to church anymore because it's full of hypocrites. You ever heard that? What are we being hypocritical about? I think it's, we say that we love, but do we truly love? You know, I'm not going to tell them I'm, I'm perfect. <laughs> I'm far from it that I'm doing it all right and you need to follow me and buy my tapes and CDs and all that kind of stuff? Tapes, where did that come from? We haven't sold tapes. I mean, those haven't been used in a long time. No, I'm a sinner saved by grace. And, and God loved me and, and gave me what I didn't deserve and he didn't give me what I do deserve. And he wants to do that for everybody else too. And that should be our goal is to, to share that good news. And that's really what began the, the epistle to the Romans. It was talking about the, the gospel, the power of salvation for everyone who will believe. And we should love the, our neighbor and, and show them that salvation is available for them too. That's what God's will is. He wants none to perish, but all come to salvation, to repentance. Verse 5 says, But they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to men in regards to the body, but live according to God in regards to the spirit. Verse 7 says, The end of all things is near. Therefore be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. And above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sin. 
You know, I think about what Paul was dealing with there at the church at, at, at Rome. I think they'd kind of forgotten and they'd lost sight of love. You know, I think that's something that's vital. It has to be in the church today. And it's something maybe the church has lost sight of. And I'm not talking about just this, this building. I'm talking about the, the global church. Is the love of God. But it says there, the end of all things is near. I don't know about you, but I look at what's going on in the world right now. Don't you, don't you think that the end of all things is near, maybe? I'm not saying the world will end tomorrow, but I sure, it sure seems to me that we're living in the end times. The nation of Israel has been reborn. Prophetic things are happening. It's just like the, the, the world is right now, just like God said it would be in those times. People calling evil good and good evil. And, and, and a lot of people in the church are falling away. But he says uh, that we need to be clear-minded and self-controlled so that we can pray. Notice he puts that as the first thing on his list there. What do we pray for? Well, I'd say we pray for the same things that Jesus prayed for in John 17. The unity in the church. The unity of the believers. And that we be united with Christ as he is united with the Father. We, we be about his work and his business. And what did he do while he was here on earth? He loved. He loved the world so much that he went to the cross and died for the sins that we deserve death for. So, the church, how are we to behave? We love people. When they come in and maybe they say, well, you know, I, I, I only read this version or maybe, maybe I, this is what I do for a dietary, you know, uh, regimen or this is how I, I worship. Or, we don't look down upon them for that. We, we love them and say, thank goodness you came to Christ. He's my savior too and we, we're brothers and sisters. All the rest of it, well, let's let God clean people up. He's, he's still got a lot of work to do on me. And above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. I think those are pretty clear marching orders that God has given us to love. You know, uh, again, I think... God's people have lost sight of that. You know, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Because that covers over <laughs> a multitude of problems, of sins. And as he said, everything that's not done out of faith is sin. So, anyway, I hope... This passage is one that encourages us. You know, it, it, it's not about the form. The, the, it's not about the appearance. It, it's about our hearts. Jesus looks at the insides. And, and you know, I, I think about that, again, the thief on the cross. He had nothing to offer God except his inside, his heart. And he said, remember me. Well, I think the, the, the truth of the gospel is kind of boiled down right there in his testimony. That's all we can do is, Lord, remember me because I, I believe that you've paid for my sins. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this time that we are able to spend in your word, Lord. And Lord, so much of the world is so religious and, and full of things that, that give the appearance of godliness, but yet, Lord, they're so far away from your heart. Lord, help us to love. Love unconditionally with the same kind of love that you loved us with. Lord, help us to shine forth the light that you have given us and to, to send forth the gospel message, Lord, that you have given us the command to spread, the good news of salvation, Lord. 
And Lord, I, I just pray that once again, you'll move upon your people's hearts. Lord, help us to, to, to just walk with you in, in the truth of your word, Lord, and help us to, to just love on a lost and dying world, Lord, to, to look beyond those things that man might look at on the outside, but look at the insides, Lord, and help us to just love them in the same way you loved us. Lord, that's our desire. Be with us now as we go into this time of invitation, Lord, and I pray that you'll just continue to move upon our hearts, Lord, and to stir your people. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name.